It's the How to Write Funny Podcast. I'm Scott Dickers. Today I talk with Lee Camp, comedian, comedy writer, and host of the comedy news show Redacted Tonight on RT. I love interviewing people who have their own TV show. <laughs> because I'm very curious to know how that happens. Yeah. So I'm sure it's a long story. So let's start from the beginning. How, how do you get into comedy? How do you start doing this thing? Did you always want to be on TV? Yeah, I just, I started, well, I actually, before that, started just wanting to be a humor writer uh, when I was like 12. Uh, I started writing comedy and thinking that would be my path because I was not an actor. I wasn't, I didn't want to be on a stage. I was pretty shy and uh, didn't do any acting in high school. Um, and then became a little obsessed with like, okay, I, I can do stand-up comedy. Um, even though I'd still never been on a stage, I started writing stand-up comedy bits. Uh, you know, Seinfeld was pretty inspirational for me. Um, and before that, honestly, it was it was Dave Barry and then The Onion. So I think those were, in terms of writing, uh, those were inspirational. Um, but so then I got on stage for the first time at around 17, 18. And it wasn't good, you know, but it was, uh, it was, I got enough laughs that I didn't quit immediately. I think I went into those first performances thinking if, if I get nothing and they, if they really hate me, then this may be over. So I got lucky that in those first few performances, I did okay. Uh, and then I just became obsessed with stand-up comedy and that's all I've wanted to do since. Um, I wanted to be on TV to do stand-up comedy, um, and I certainly wasn't turning down acting gigs. I wanted to be, uh, I could see myself, at the when I was early 20s, I could see myself doing sitcoms or something, and I went out on acting auditions and did a little bit of acting, but um, the stand-up became increasingly political, and I didn't really, I kind of stopped taking auditions for things, because I didn't really want to say other people's words that much. Um, that doesn't mean I would, uh, you know, turn down every acting role if it was thrown at me. But uh, my my true passion and my focus has been political comedy since you know 25, and before that it was just kind of bland, not bland, but observational stand-up comedy, not political. Um, and then I, I, yeah, I toured around. I did a ton of stand-up comedy. I toured colleges. For years, I was making my living from mainly colleges, although I performed in New York City almost every night of the week. Uh, those early days, I was performing between three and six shows a night, but, you know, those are seven to ten-minute spots at a comedy club. So, But even that amount of stage time is rare for a young comic, so it was, it was a good kind of uh, trial by fire in that you're just up on stage every single night. Was this in the alternative <clears throat> scene in New York? Uh, no, this was mainly in the kind of uh, hacky Times Square rooms. Uh, I'd like to think I wasn't hacky, but you were performing largely for tourists that would get ushered into the room off of Times Square. And uh, there's still some there's still some comedy clubs there in, in the Times Square area, but there was this kind of prime bubble of about a five-year period, I guess it was probably 2001 to 2007 or something, that you could just, the, the people would hand out flyers and just usher everybody into comedy clubs, just the hundreds, you know, especially during prime tourist se season. It was just, everybody's taking a flyer, get in there, pay your seven bucks and go see a comedy show. And, and of course, the tourists would be lied to. They would be told, you know, Dave Chappelle's going to be here and so and so is going to be here, and of course, those people never were. It was just me at 21 trying to, <laughs> to stand up, but to still to have that much because I see I see guys and I you know nowadays starting out and to see them they're like oh yeah well I got seven minutes on Tuesday and I'll do another seven minutes on Saturday and that's a good week for them and it's like and and you know I I I feel bad for them because I wish they could have more stage time because who knows, maybe one day they'd be brilliant if they got enough practice. Uh, it's just kind of stage time, stage time, stage time. Are you getting paid for that stage time or not? Uh, well, <clears throat> at first, um, by the way, the name of this uh, kind of crappy club, which I don't think is still around, was called Ha Comedy Club. That was the main one I was at. I was at some of the others but uh, when I was younger. But uh, I would get 
they would, when you first started, they would force you to hand out flyers for the room. And if you did an hour of handing out flyers, then you got seven minutes on stage. And I would often do three hours of handing out flyers a night and three seven minute spots, not just because I wanted the stage time, although that was the main thing, but also because I was dead broke. So it was like, and you get a dollar for every flyer that came in with your name or number on the back or whatever. So I probably encountered you. <laughs> Handing walking, out flyers. Walking down the there, street, yeah. Because, right? yep. I mean, if you were there for three hours a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> he probably walked by me and thought, oh, that was assholes. God damn it. I think that's what everybody thinks, unless they're a tourist. <laughs> unless they're they, a tourist, they yeah. They're getting a really unique opportunity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there, there is, a, however, I will slightly defend myself. There is a difference between people that would hand out flyers and be like, hey, if you want to go see the show, go see the show. And the new breed, which is basically the, the more established clubs like comedy, uh, not comedy seller, but comic strip and stuff, uh, danger fields. They found out that they could send a guy out there to force people to buy tickets on the spot. And so now there's these really aggressive barkers that chase you down the street like, you know, you're going to love it. You Buy the ticket now. And those guys are assholes. But, uh, but then you're <laughs> somewhere in between. You're like a funny guy. You're probably making people laugh out there, right? A little bit, although when it's thousands of people, you have three seconds with each one. So it's just, it's just here, 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 here. Take a flight, take a flight. You're not doing any like comic insult type stuff, <laughs> getting people to... I mean, I, it may be a little bit, but I, I also wasn't the type of like roast comic. I, I kind of wanted to do my polished jokes and, and not... Uh, I, I did very little crowd work coming up. Like I just wasn't into like the, hey, you in the front row, you have a gay shirt on. Like I just, I, I, I abhorred that kind of stuff, so... So I went the other direction of like, hey, everybody, you in the audience, just listen. I'm going to do my routine. Uh, just shut up and let me do it, <laughs> which is also not the best way to go. But. It doesn't work in every club, right? Because some clubs expect more interaction, right? Some clubs, yeah. They, they, and the, some clubs, the audience expects more interaction. They're, right. like, they're known as like a club, you know, I think Stress Factory in, in uh, New Jersey is kind of known for like, they'll do prank phone calls and insult the oh, audience right. and all this stuff. and. And that interactive thing. And, you know, for the comics that are good at it, it's impressive to watch. It's, it's kind of like improv stand-up comedy uh, for the comics that are good at it. But, yeah, no, I've always been more of the, the George Carlin school of you write your bits out and you do them and you see what works and you see what doesn't. And, and so, so I was getting, I was kind of lucky in stage time in st early on in two respects. One was those little, little spots in New York. And then I got lucky, well, you know, Luck is, whatever the expressions are, luck is, it's, it's luck is half the battle and the other half is being ready when that lucky door opens. Right. So I got really lucky that there was a cancellation and this NACA performance and NACA is where all the colleges decide who they're going to book. And I, and there's never a cancellation because there's too much money at stake. If someone has a good knack. Yeah, those are like 2000 bucks just to get into those things, right? Yeah. Yeah. You pay just to get in. And then, and then if you have a good set, you could book 60 or 80 colleges. You could, we could be talking 60 or 80 grand if you have a great performance. Right. So no one ever cancels. Well, this guy cancels at the last minute and I get the spot. And I also, there's a million other little lucky things like you have to be on a good day because the schools have all spent all their money by the end of the NACA festival or whatever. And so all these various things fell into line and I'm 24 and I had the, you know, the set of my young career in front of all these college bookers and ended up with 80 colleges that year. Fantastic. And so you're going around the nation doing 80 hours. And you're doing an hour. Yeah, probably. you're doing an hour each time with no opener. So the, uh, uh, some college student wanders out and, and goes, uh, please welcome Lee Camp, and then wanders off stage. And then you do your hour. Uh, um, so it was, I was doing mainly you know, college observational comedy, but it was just great to have those hours to learn how to be a comedian. Um, and. And so that went from there. Then I became more political. Colleges don't want to book political comics. So that kind of filtered away. Um, and I had a couple of pretty lean years where it was like, you know, you make 25 bucks for a spot at the comedy club, at, at, you know, wherever I was, Comedy Cellar, Caroline's. But you're not making money on that, really. Right. Um, and uh, I... I, uh, Huffington Post actually had a paid humor staff for about a year, so I was on that, and they paid actually all right, all right so I made a living that for a year, and then eventually I had this kind of successful YouTube show called Moment of Clarity, where it was just me kind of ranting, written but ranting comedy to the camera uh, for five minutes, two to three times a week about political subjects. Um, 
and that got pretty successful. It was right around the time of Occupy, so that gave it a big boost, was people caring about this stuff, and I was ranting about this stuff, and it fit together, and also plenty of comedy fit in, you know, crammed in there. Um, so that got me enough kind of notoriety that uh, certain TV shows wanted me on as a comedic commentator. Now, most channels are, I'm too, f too far left, but really just too anti-corporate. It's, you can't really be as anti-corporate as I am right. and, and be accepted on there. So I would go on each of the networks once and then they wouldn't have me back. <laughs> so <laughs> right. it was like CNN once, Fox News once, MSNBC once. So you at least wisely didn't tell them how political you were before you went on. You went on, did your thing, and then let them figure it out. Right, and especially uh, Fox News had me on because they knew I wrote for the Huffington Post, and they, th and they knew I was liberal, and they wanted to do a liberal comedian versus a right-wing comedian. But they didn't know that I was liberal enough not to be friendly on their show. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, they, I think they think a liberal is like Hillary Clinton. Right. They right. have no idea. <laughs> that, 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 that or people, at least at that time. <laughs> that people like me exist. Exactly. <laughs> uh, left of Hillary, how could that be? Um, and so I wasn't, but I was, I, I, you know, hate them enough that I wasn't going to go on and just be friendly. So I, I went on and kind of tore them a new one. And that then, I did it just because I felt I needed to do it, but that then went viral and kind of became a calling card where people knew me from that, uh, which helped in some ways, but also put the nail in the coffin for the college touring. That was the end of that. Because <laughs> uh -huh. they would Google me and they don't want, they don't want that at their colleges. So, um, And then, yeah, once I was, so, but, the, but the channel that was uh, willing to have me back fairly regularly was RT America, so I was on... Uh, Abby Martin had a successful show, and Max Kaiser, and Tom Hartman, and um, and then when they wanted to create a comedy show, they came to me, and they said, can you create a comedy show? And I said, yeah. And that's where Redacted Tonight came from. That's great. It, it all sounds very charmed, but I know that's the short version, and there's a lot of hard work in there. <laughs> I want to go back and kind of drill down in on yeah, some, yeah, yeah. some of sure. that stuff. Sure, sure. Let's, let's go back to the very beginning, like when you're 12 and you decide you want to be a writer. Like, how does that happen? Do you have some sort of driving need to create comedy? Is it just something you find that you're like, this is fun? Or are you the, the funny guy? Like, what's the story of how you get to that point? I think, well, well being able to look back on it as an adult that can understand a, a brain better than you can when you're 12... When I was 12, I think I just thought, this is fun and I like this and this is, I think I could be good at this. And I was, when I would make friends laugh, uh, you know, I, I liked that a lot. But I think looking back on it, I was kind of a shy kid and I was uh, kind of, not physically, but mentally beaten up by my older brother. I mean, he's kind of a genius. And so you, when I was a kid, he would just, you know, uh, kind of drive me nuts intentionally but he would not less physically and more more just kind of mentally you know outsmart me and make fun of me and make me look stupid and all that stuff and so I think I realized that the one time that it kind of seemed like he was on my side or or I had won his approval was when I would make him laugh and it was usually involuntary he wasn't he wasn't running around talking about how funny I was instead he was running around insulting me so so when I would make him laugh it was like I had won and so I think then it became a, a fight for me to make him laugh, and really my dad as well, because I knew that meant I had my dad's attention and stuff like that. So I think looking back on it, that's probably what started it. Um, but then it just became something I, I loved and I worked on, so I would you know, sit there in my room alone. Uh, you know, this is a, a pretty pretty cool 13-year-old sitting in your room alone just uh, <laughs> looking through mad magazines and uh, writing and I, I guess I did a lot of different forms for a while, but then I kind of honed in on, on Dave Barry and wrote humor columns and kind of got really into writing humor columns at 14, 15. And did you show them to anybody or did they just pile up? or <clears throat> Some piled up. I did show them to my family who, you know, my, my mom found them so funny and she would read them to friends and stuff. Um, and... And yeah, I think even just that, it was like that was the only time that the adults gave a shit what I was doing. So it was like when my mom would pull, you know, my grandparents or whoever into a room and be like, I'm going to read to you this thing that Lee wrote. And it was like, wow, these, this, this group of people has never sat around and talked about anything I've ever done. 
So it was, it was probably a reward in that way. Yeah, you're getting um, a lot of reward for the comedy early. Uh, from the brother and from yeah. the rest of the family. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think if you don't, if they make fun of you, then it can stop you in your tracks, probably, uh, if they tell you it's stupid or something. And, and like I said about the stand-up, if those first few times performing stand-up, I had gotten no response, it's quite possible I would have quit early. At least the, I would have stuck with the writing and quit the stand-up. Yeah. Uh, when, in fact, it's like those first few times don't really tell you anything. Um, you know, you could bomb those first few times and be an amazing comedian 10 years later. It just depends. Uh, but yeah, a lot of it did pile up, though. A lot of it was just, I mean, I didn't think of it as I'm doing this for myself, but it, it wasn't going anywhere. I, I maybe mailed some to some magazines that ignored it. And uh, what else did I do with them? Yeah, I, 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 oh, and then I started writing. F uh, there was a literary magazine in high school that I got something published in, which was probably the first thing published. Um, and what high school was that? It's Douglas South Hall Freeman in Richmond, Virginia. And like fancy, good school, or just a regular public high school? It, it was public, regular public high, public high school, but uh, I think Richmond has okay public high schools, so it wasn't, it wasn't like pathetic, but it was not, uh, not a ritzy school. Yeah. yeah, so you're getting a lot of reward, you're getting a lot of good feedback from all this, and probably feeling pretty good about yourself, I would think. There's one, one of the theories of, of humor, laughter, like why we laugh is that it's a gesture of submission. So you're like baring your teeth to show that you're not a threat and it makes the person who made you laugh feel like they have the upper hand in that situation. Right. Right. And it seems like that was kind of the primary thing you, you were getting. You were getting self-esteem from it because you were making other people see you as an important Right, and in all other ways, I was kind of a shy, just, uh, you know, unhappy kid. I wasn't, I, I hated kind of, I hated middle school, and I hated uh, some of high school. I think I think by my junior, senior year, I was confident enough in myself that I enjoyed it enough. But, um, but I, yeah, I, I think the, part of the reason I was willing to sit home and, work, and sit there writing was because I, that I had fun doing, whereas I hated school, I hated... Uh, you know, most of the, the stuff that went on that, that I think a lot of normal kids enjoy, so. I hear you there. So <laughs> the transition to performing strikes me as a pretty big one to have yeah. made at that early age. Yeah. So how did that happen? Were you just not getting the same reward from the writing, even though you're getting it published in the school paper and stuff like that? What drives you to actually want to perform? It seems like a huge step. Yeah, I, I think I wanted that. I wanted that direct response. Cause oh, you're tired of having to wait to hear. Yeah, later. You ba basically, when you write a humor column, you gotta wait and you know see if you see someone reading it, or or see if someone walks up to you and goes, "Hey, did you write that column? That was funny." Like you don't get that, and so I really wanted that direct response of I said something funny, and and you and I get the laugh. Yeah, and it's not scientific either. It's like, well, what part was funny? Like it was this <laughs> in, in stand up? Every single nuance it comes right back to you. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So I can understand that. So it was it was more of a a way to improve your craft almost, right? And I think that a lot of stand ups have this moment where they see certain stand up comedians and they go, oh, I could do that. You Whereas heard that? Well, 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 I think first I saw, you know, people on TV like Seinfeld and Carlin and stuff, and I didn't think I could do that. I thought, I don't know, I don't know how they do that. Um, but then you see, you know, young comic specials or some of the crappier ones that get thrown on TV. And I was watching one guy, and I'm, you know, 16, 17, and I'm like, my writing is so much better than that. Like, I could easily do that, you know. But then you probably discovered when you got on stage that it's a lot different than just writing. Like there's a lot more going on there. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of lot of delivery involved. Although I think it took me a long time to really accept how big, how important delivery is. Um, I kind of thought that if I just wrote the best jokes in the world, then eventually people would. It wouldn't matter if I just read them quietly. <laughs> they just <laughs> they just fall down laughing. Um, and some comedians kind of get away with that. Some just do. Being very plain. <coughs> Some do. Well, yeah, some, some that becomes their thing. It's like, it's like people want that from them, but, but that's pretty rare that, it's, that, it, that a comedian can get away with almost no delivery. But. Yeah, and you've got a really interactive style that plays off the audience, and you're obviously trying to maximize every tool that you have as, as a stand-up. Yeah, I try to play off the energy of 
the room, definitely. And I think also probably the fact that I talk about politics meant that in these clubs in New York, and some of the clubs are kind of brutal, you know, they, they, you get on stage and the, the initial kind of feeling in the room is, uh, fuck, you make me laugh. So it's, it's not a loving audience. Right. So I think I became very attuned to like, okay, I'm losing them, so I need to do some easier observational stuff to get them back. Okay, I have them back. Now I can push them a little farther, and it's kind of this give and pull. Whereas now, when I do, a lot of the shows I'm doing are for fans of my stuff, which is a different animal because it's, like, it's nice because you, you know you can go out and push those limits, and they're going to come with you because they're just they're, they're like, oh, yeah, I, I know what he does, and I'm in for this. You know? Yeah, so is that enjoyable, or is that like not a challenge enough for you? I largely like it because I, I think that it's, it's like with the TV show, plenty of people that are not fans of mine are still seeing my stuff. Um, so it's not like I'm living in a bubble and only preaching to the choir. But when I go out on the road and do some of these stand-up gigs, it is, uh, I, I rarely now play a room that it's like no, no one knows what they're getting involved in. And, you know, I, I largely like that. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, the, the misery of, of trying to force politics down the throats of like tourists that are like, I just came to laugh, is it's something I'm glad I went through and like you glad you go through those tough days, but it's not like I'm just dying to, to force my brand of comedy on people that might not like it. <laughs> so. Well, there's one thing I notice about your political humor in the standup is that you make it really accessible. There's a way that you have, and I'd love to get in this with you because most comics are, their material is liberal and their subtext is very liberal and progressive. Right. That's the stuff that works with audiences. To walk over the line and actually do it very politically is something not a lot of comedians make the choice to do. And the fact that you've done it has been really good for you. Obviously, you know, you have your own TV show and you're doing well, but I'm wondering if there was ever a time when you felt like, oh, this could be, you know, this could be a bad career move because you mentioned that you were kind of having a hard time there when you lost the college gigs and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was it was never a smart career move, and I pretty much knew that. I think I didn't know the extent that this business, meaning television or comedy business or whatever, is kind of uh, antagonistic towards outwardly political stuff as opposed to kind of personal political. Um, but so I didn't know that, for example. I was basically on Comedy Central like once, and even though I was in New York for 12 years, and during at least half of those, I was well known at all the clubs as a good comic and everything, but they didn't really want anything to do with me, and I think it had to do with the, the political leanings of my stuff. Um, and, and so it was never a good career move, but I kind of felt, A, it was what I was interested in, and if I'm not talking about what I'm interested in, then what am I doing up there? Because I got into this career to to talk about what I want to talk about. And B, I kind of felt like, since I'm also an activist, I felt like it's important. I felt like, you know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna stand on a stage in front of people every night of the week, then I'm gonna talk about these crucial things uh, in a way that can make them laugh and and take them take in some information at the same time but also enjoy themselves and you know i think if you were to talk to like other comedians in new york and stuff there's really no time that i was like i'm just gonna get on stage and rant about politics and not get the laughs like i don't care if these people aren't laughing you know i i was never that never that type of like i'm just gonna force this down their throats it was always like can i tell them this stuff and get laughs and so I think it was pretty rare that I ever like went off on a rant that just left the audience cold. So uh, I felt like I was doing my job and at the same time talking about something important. And it was a bad, I knew it was a bad career. I mean, the fact that I have a TV show now is kind of a fluke in a lot of ways. It's this, <laughs> the, the path I went down is not built for getting a TV show. Yeah, no, it's very counterintuitive. Like you say, kind of bad career move stuff. But one thing I noticed about your, your tale of how you got to where you are is you know what you like and you know what you want to do and you just do that and you don't really care about what the effect of that is going to be. And that's, that's a rare thing in people in 
uh, the entertainment business. Yeah, yeah. Most people are, you know, they're they're writing to the market. You know, you're, you're yeah. taking the opportunities that you can. But I think for a long time I I wasn't writing to the market, but for a long time I was willing to to change to fit into whatever box the opportunity was. So when I was like 24 or whatever, early to mid 20s, and people would say to me, well, what do you want to do in comedy? And I always found that a baffling question because I was like, I want to do whatever the door is that's open. It's like comedy is such a tough career to make it at. If someone says, here's a film script, I'll take a film script. If they say, here's a sitcom, I'll take a sitcom. I'll work on a sitcom. If they say, here's, here's a touring schedule, I'll go touring. Like, I was like, wherever the door opens, I'm, I want to be in comedy. But that then changed when I you know, got to my uh, second half of my 20s and became more of an activist and cared about what I was saying more and was like, I'm not going to go on these acting auditions. I was doing uh, some commercial even auditions when I was mid-20s, and I finally was like, what do, like, even if I could make money doing this, it would be so miserable. I'm so miserable going on these auditions for things I hate, saying things that I don't, you know, for commercials that I don't even find funny. That, you know, I remember the final one I went on, uh, it was a Starburst ad, and, and I had a commercial age. I'd only landed, like, one. I really didn't land. I think I landed my first one I ever went out for and then never landed another commercial. But uh, I went out for this commercial. It's like an ad for Starburst, and you're supposed to be a – you're, you're going to play the role of a whale trainer. And the, the script says, oh, then the whale throws up on you, and you say, yay, Starburst, or something like that. And I was like, oh, Jesus – and so I went in, and I'm already kind of, like, miserable, like, why am I doing this? And so then I go into the room, and she goes, okay, and uh, because, you know, in the commercial, you'll, you'll be in the, uh, you'll be a whale, whale trainer, you'll have your shirt off, so take off your shirt, and then we'll do the script. And, and I was just like, no, no. And it wasn't even like, I'm not even out of shape or anything. It's just so humiliating. It's like, take off your clothes and this whale's going to throw, throw up on you. And I was like, thanks. And I walked out and that was the last uh, commercial audition yeah. I ever went on. That was like an Irene Cara <laughs> from fame moment. <laughs> That's wonderful. So was there a catalyst around that time that, that really motivated you to, to get political and to become an activist? Or was that a gradual process? It was gradual. Um, I think the Iraq War was some of it. Some of it was when I was driving around playing all these colleges. I would, you know, I was driving between thirty and sixty thousand miles a year, and from college to college, I would listen to Sirius XM and these political stations because, you know, you, you could only listen to music so long before you want to blow your brains out. So, I was listening to like Air America and stuff, and kind of learning and uh, about more about politics. Um, and about what goes on in our country. And then I started reading, you know, I kind of educated myself and was reading Chomsky and Chris Hedges and stuff. And, um, but I, I feel like the moment, though, that pushed me from just like, oh, I, I kind of care about this stuff and I'm going to start putting in my writing and stuff to like being like, a, like considering myself an activist was... There was this guy on death row in Texas named Kenneth Foster, and he hadn't killed anyone. And the prosecution said he hadn't killed anyone because uh, in Texas they have a law where if you're, like, near a murderer, <laughs> they can execute you. Um, and it was insane, and I never heard of such a thing, that the prosecution said this guy hadn't murdered anyone. And, and so uh, I, along with a few thousand people in the country, although it wasn't that big a story, it's kind of a quiet little story, uh, uh, but I started calling the governor. It was Rick Perry at the time, Governor Rick Perry. And I started calling the governor and stuff, and you, you get his uh, secretary, and she'd kind of ignore you and say, okay, I'll add you to the tally of people that don't want to execute this guy. And so I then call. I was like, there's got to be a way I can have more of an impact. So I called and said I was a movie studio, and we're making a big documentary on the death of Kenneth Foster, and it's going to be called Blood on Texas's Hands, and I'd like to interview the governor, and it's going to be a really, you know, we, this is a multi-million dollar picture and everything. And, and so she puts me through the press secretary, and I tell the press secretary the same thing. And she says, okay, I need to speak to Rick Perry, and I'll, you know, Governor Perry, I'll get back to you or whatever. And a few days later, he commutes the sentence. And Rick Perry commuted almost no sentences. He, he, he loved executing people. Um, now, I knew it wasn't only me that did it, but there wasn't that many activists that cared about this thing. So I think it was a very small number of us that were fighting to save this guy's life. And when, that, when I found out that guy had lived... It really made me feel like such a small number of us had saved this guy's life that 
that it really is like maybe not one person, but maybe a couple dozen people can can really change a life or or change something in this world. And uh, and so I feel like that was a, a key moment for me. It was I was excited, but then I was like, ah, shit. Now I gotta care, like immensely care. <laughs> like it was this moment where I was like, "Oh, this is not good." <laughs> like, because you knew what it was gonna do to your career or your life. Or no, what? not I wasn't thinking about my comedy career. Just, but just my life. It was like, it was like now all these articles I read where I'm like, "Oh, that kind of sucks for those people." I need to like, there needs to be a second step where I'm like, "Can I personally have some sort of impact on this?" Uh, it, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if it, I, I think it kind of changed the way I viewed like activism and stuff. So. Hmm. so you use your comedy in your activism, do you not? You speak to other activists and so forth? Yeah, to some degree. Uh, I'm asked to speak at protests and sometimes I insert some comedy in there. Um, sometimes I don't, uh, I, j- I, I don't really know where the line is and it makes me feel kind of, because sometimes when you're trying to make people laugh at a protest, it it it's almost like you're you got to be careful to make it not seem like you're mocking the protest, even though obviously your jokes are not mocking it. But just the fact that you're inserting any comedy into this serious issue, you know, uh, can can make people feel weird. So you got to be careful on that. And you know, I did several at Occupy. I toured. I mean, I was touring the country. Otherwise, but each city I would go to, I would then perform at Occupy. I performed at Occupy Chicago and and about a dozen other cities. And I would insert comedy into it, but it worked there because I felt like people, you know, with Occupy, people were there for so long and they really needed a laugh. And so it it, it worked well. But but I spoke about, uh, I spoke at a protest recently about the uh, Dakota Pipeline that they're trying to tear through... uh, the Standing Rock Reservation. Did you in go out there? North Dakota. This no, this was a protest in D.C. because the, it's working its way through the D.C. courts. Uh, so it was in front of a court in D.C. this past week. Um, and I didn't put any jokes into it. It was just a straight a straight protest speech. But. Yeah, well, it's a tricky balance, you know, to know when to entertain and know when things are serious. And when you're in that kind of in really serious situations where maybe people are getting arrested and other stuff yeah. is going on like all you've learned about how to read a crowd and how to, mm-hmm. how to know what to do is, is coming in handy in, in that yeah. part of your life yeah okay so we took a sidetrack a little bit through the politics which i i wanted to hear about but now i want to take us back to making the transition from stand-up to doing more tv stuff you mentioned that you did some youtube videos i know a lot of people who do comedy want to do YouTube videos and they want to get on YouTube and they want to have a video that goes viral or whatever. And you had a lot of good luck with that. So how did you do that? Did you put yourself on your iPhone and upload that? Or did you have friends with a studio or, or, and then did you do anything to promote the video? Yeah, well, actually, and now that I'm thinking about it, I think it was, you know, the key is to learn from your failures. And I think that's what I did because I, I had tried to create a, a news, uh, actually, probably heavily onion inspired uh but it was before onion video so it was going to be a newscast with so the onion copied you the onions the onion stole my video thing yeah no actually we were we were doing it and then we did it for a couple of months and then onion video came out and then people told me i was trying to copy onion video and i was like shit but uh but it was it was what i was trying to do had failed anyway so it was unconnected to the onion but it was it was going to be a newscast that was uh, you know uh fake fake news basically um but the problem and i guess it's a good problem to have is that i was working with my brother who's now a very successful director comedy director editor um he did marcel the shell with shoes on and some other very viral things but I was working with him, and he's a perfectionist, and he is the type of person. Marcel the Shell, which has been seen by millions around the world and has a best-selling book and everything, uh, it, it took him a year to basically put out a five-minute video, and then it goes hugely viral, and then it takes him another year to put out another one. And so he is the opposite of me, where I'm like, where I'm like I want to write this and get it out, and these are important stories, and let's do it, and just make it, get it done. And so... He was making it perfectionist. I was like, let's get it done. And it just wasn't coming out regularly enough. You know, we'd get, we'd get three five-minute things out a month or something. 
So then when I decided to create my own YouTube thing separate from working with anyone, I was like, okay, well, what are the things that I need in order to make this easy, in order to be able to create content regularly? And it was like, well, one is this, whatever I do needs to be able to be filmed in any city because I'm touring. Uh, it needs to be short. It needs to, uh, it needs to be, it can have poor lighting because I'm in a hotel room. So basically I created a five minute rant thing to camera um, that was done off my laptop cam and I added a little filter so it didn't look as shitty as you'd think a laptop cam would look. Um, and Where do you get a filter like that? Oh, you just in uh, uh, Final Cut, you just add it on. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. So it's some sort of like um, post, yeah. post color or lighting type effect. Or yeah, something? yeah. Okay. At at first, I at first I did like a sketchy effect, and then later I changed it to kind of a, a vignette, kind of shadowy effect or whatever. It. But so it it made it so that you couldn't tell that I had terrible lighting and <laughs> right. all this stuff. Right. Um, but it was just like let's keep the filming and the editing simple. And what my talent is, is writing. So I'll make the writing and hopefully the performance good and, and make the, the editing and everything almost nothing. Um, and so I think that worked because I was able to get out. I was putting out two to three a week of these five minute things and they were on current news and it would come out a day after the story broke or whatever. And it was, it was really like on top of what was happening in the world. Um, did and you, did it, you learn things about how to title them so that people would find them, or did you just use your gut horse sense for that? I'm now a title ninja. I feel like yeah, titling you, you titling probably, <laughs> titling is so key. It's, it is. I'll bet I'll bet you do the titling for your show, right? Or you help? I do all the titling. You do all that, and yeah. you do all the writing on the show. All, all of my all of the stuff I say. Oh, right. okay. Yeah. So yeah, back to the to the YouTube. So you learned how to be a magnetic headline writer. Uh, it, it took a while because I didn't know how important headlines were and I thought you just put the title in there or whatever but it, but you know Upworthy has will tell you they've made a, a, a very successful business off of basically good titling yep. so titling is pivotal uh, and and yeah the titling I think was important and then just growing my Facebook feed and that kind of thing and and so stuff started to go a little viral. I think mainly, uh, basically what I was talking about and Occupy dovetailed with each other and then the energy behind Occupy helped m move my stuff forward. Um, yeah, go ahead. I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask for like three titling tips. Uh, it's, I think the key is, and I don't, I'm not the one that came up with this term, but it's a curiosity gap. You want to create something that creates a little bit of curiosity but not so much that people go, oh, that's clickbait. So if you title it, you know, here's the thing that will kill you or the, you know, the, the product that you have in your house that might kill you. Mo most people don't want to click on that because that's too, that's too clickbaity. Um, instead, instead, like a title I just put up today, we just put up a segment today is uh, the army just admitted they, uh, they wrongfully accounted six point five trillion dollars, and then it says like question mark exclamation point. And so people know what they're getting with the story. I'm talking about the army admitting they, you know, wrongfully accounted for six point five. Uh, sorry, did I say million trillion dollars? Six point five trillion dollars. Um, so they know what they're getting with the story, but they're like, wait, really? So you want people to go, wait, really? Or wait, they can't be? Or are you kidding me? Like if you can evoke that response in people, then they'll click the video. But if you evoke the response like that's, that's uh, you know, excessively, if you make the curiosity back, gap too big, they, they won't make the jump and they, they'll just hate you. <laughs> they'll just be like, oh, fuck you. That's great. What, <laughs> what's another couple? Um, well, it's, you know, one key is to, is to be on the the trend of news um hitting the 24-hour news cycle yeah hard. yeah i mean it, which is annoying because i try and avoid trump and stuff i mean we've done we've done trump segments but it's like stuff that's over covered i try to avoid um um so yeah it, it, it part i'd say another is to is to work out your niche are you and then to develop that fan base so you know, I could, let's say, let, you know, everyone knows that Kim Kardashian gets clicks right online. But if I were to make a Kim Kardashian segment, it would do horribly because my audience that I've created on my Facebook page, on my Twitter and everywhere doesn't give a fuck about Kim Kardashian. So even if I put up a great titled Kim Kardashian video, it's not going to get anything. And so it is create a niche and a fan base that 
will want to see your type of video. So if you are, if you do women's issues, then stick to that in a way. I mean, that doesn't mean you can't ever branch out. I think people should branch out, but it's, it, you know, you want to create that fan base that, okay, well, I have a women's issues fan base. And so this women's issues video will do well. Um, and, and, and in that way, I think, I, I think, so it's not just whatever's clickbait. I can't, I can't just throw Kim Kardashian up there. All right. Thanks for those tips. So <laughs> I hope that helps a little. Those but. are good. <laughs> tell us then about the current show on the RT network. First of all, tell us about the RT tele. Is it called RT TV or RT television or just RT or what are they? Called? Uh, well, there's RT International. I'm I'm with RT America. Okay. Um, and is it Russian owned? Yeah. So it's Russian owned, which is basically why I'm able to be there because I can't. I, I'm not really accepted on any network that's getting corporate dollars. So. Right. So because, you know, it doesn't mean can, uh, Comedy Central never makes a Walmart joke. They, I'm sure they do, but they don't have a lot of them. They don't spend their day in and day out saying, hey, guys, you know, oil and gas is destroying our world. They know and, the limit. Yeah. Like, they're going li- to the, get the laughs, but they're not going to push it right. so that the boss comes down and says, yeah, hold, hold yeah, off on that. Let's the- back off a little. <laughs> uh, so there is a limit to that. Um, and so there's a very select number of networks that I can uh, have the freedom of speech that I have. I mean, and, and here's a perfect example. This week, uh, Jill, it came out just yesterday. Jill Stein was on PBS NewsHour, which you think of as a pretty unbiased source. They, and you can watch it online because someone got the original copy. They literally cut her mid-sentence, cut out mentions of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and climate change and some other things, and aired it as if there had been no cut. And so it's like, wow, mid-sentence, you're cutting someone out and, and you're cutting out the things you don't want to talk about. And it was like, that's from PBS NewsHour with Judy Woodruff, and that's supposed to be one of the more unbiased sources. Yeah. It's scary. And, and it's so ironic, though, because you know we grew up thinking that Russia was the anti-free speech state. Uh-huh. And here we are, you're on the only network where you have free speech, and it's Russian. It's, it, yeah, it's, I mean, it's pretty sad that we're in that position. And... I, I will say that I am an American in America uh, doing uh, American television about American issues. Um, Do you get- but if I, were, if I were in Russia, if I were a Russian in Russia, I would be doing a different thing probably. But I am speaking to Americans as an American, and this is what I feel is important. Yeah, you'd probably be in trouble. In Russia, <laughs> well, for talking about Russians, is quite do, quite possibly. Do you get um, flack for that from people saying that being on a Russian network, saying negative things about America? Anybody ever saying like that's weird or that you know? Because we all know that like Putin's trying to do all this stuff to tear America down. And well, I mean, yeah, some people don't like it, but I, I think you. I, I would ask that people watch my content and judge it on its on its face value you know no one's telling me what to say and if you go back and watch those you that youtube series moment of clarity where there's 300 and whatever 20 episodes uh you will see that i'm saying all the same stuff and i've been saying it for years and years so if if anyone can come to me and say oh look how you've changed what you're saying because you're on this new network then i'd love to hear it because i'm saying the same stuff i've been saying for years well it's, it's um, a little different than that because like you know you the reason you have somebody like you know, a corporatist like Wolf Blitzer on CNN, mm-hmm. he didn't change the way he is either. He's always been a corporatist and they hire the corporatist to be on the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if the, if the Russians wanted to hire someone to bring down Hillary Clinton, for example, so that Trump could get elected, you would be the perfect guy. Well, I mean, obviously, if you if you want to talk about the geopolitical struggle, it, it is going to benefit pretty much most other countries for the truth about America or about our, you know, corporate control of our government or the fact that we're in an oligarchy, it would benefit most other countries to have that truth out there. Well, I would um, argue it would benefit us. Uh, well, me too. That's why I do <laughs> what I do. do that, that's why I feel what I do is one of the most patriotic things you can do is, is say, hey, we're capable of so much more. And instead, we're being lied to on our, on our networks. Um, and, and so to me, that's very patriotic. But what I'm wondering is, has anyone ever given you flack for that? It occurred to me that, that that's a dynamic that could cause some people to complain. And I'm just wondering if you've ever heard any or if I'm just making stuff up. No, I, get, I mean, I get some complaints or some people that just say, oh, it's RT America, therefore uh, turn it off, don't listen. 
Um, and I, I just ask you to judge me on my content. If you want to go look up the stories I'm talking about and, and point out that I'm lying about any of them, I'd love to hear it because, you know, you can, I, I always try and show the headline reveals and everything from everything we're talking about. So like that army story I just mentioned, that's from Reuters. And it's like, if you, if you can point out that I'm making any of this shit up, then I, I, I would yeah. enjoy hearing it. Um, but sure, some people just see a logo and they immediately turn off. And I think that's kind of sad. Yeah, it is. And I mean, it's one of the perils of doing political comedy, too, is that you're naturally going to get enemies. You're going to get people who disagree with you politically, who therefore aren't going to enjoy your comedy. Absolutely. And and one of the things that made me, well, two things made me okay with uh, uh, doing a show with RT America. One was, I feel like we don't have a lot of time to fuck around. I mean, I feel like with climate change and even just environmental decimation outside of climate change, whether the planet we're heating up or not, we are making this world uninhabitable. And I'm not going to sit around and wait for, oh, the, the perfect network run by, you know, uh, vegan yoga instructors to, to ask me to do a TV show so that I can get my message out there about, you know, in, about what I want to talk about. But also, RT America has so many voices that I highly respect, like Tom Hartman, Chris Hedges, uh, um, you know, Ed Schultz is there now. Uh, there's Jesse Ventura, there's Larry King, there's, right. there, there's a, lot of, a lot of people that I uh, respect. Abby Martin uh, was there for a long time, so. So yeah, that, there are perils, but there's also a benefit in that when you're doing comedy, it's not going to work if people aren't laughing and people aren't going to laugh if what you're saying isn't resonating with them on some level that's real. Right. So it's partly why I think we don't have a conservative daily show because so much of what's coming from what they now call conservatism is just made up stuff. Like they're not, they don't even believe in science. It's just a lot of <laughs> propaganda and lies. Yeah. And it doesn't work. Like audiences aren't going to laugh if there's no basis to the joke. Yeah. So in and a way, I, you've got this extra weapon in communicating. Right. Yeah. No, I think comedy is incredibly important because it does. It, it can get past the normal kind of like, oh, I don't really want to listen about that. So I'm just going to shut it off. And it can people will listen much longer if they're laughing. Uh, I think another reason there's no real conservative daily show is because it's not all going to be punching down, but a lot of it's going to be punching down. It's going to be a lot of making fun of the poor and yeah. talk and welfare queens, uh, <laughs> welfare so queens and stuff like that. And it's like, it's like, I think even people that might, that are Republicans that are probably lovely people. I don't know that even they want to hear jokes about poor people. Like they don't want to, it's, they're not going to, ha ha, look at that homeless guy. Like it just doesn't sit right. Not only that, but they're going to be extolling the virtues of the merchant class. Right. I mean, nobody wants to laugh. It's not <laughs> right. funny either. So right. they're really in a tough spot. <laughs> yeah. You've got some luck on your side there with just the, the way the cookie crumbles. So tell us about the production of the show. How often do you do the show? How long is it? And the work involved? It must be insane. It's a lot of work, but it is very rewarding. Um, we we ha now have two shows a week, although one of them is an interview show without a live audience, which you were on. And, uh, and so that one takes some time but it takes a lot less time than the main show the main show is uh 28 minutes a week and it comes out every friday and uh i write everything i say and then uh i work with the the rest of the uh correspondents on their segments a little bit but they largely write their segments um great great people by the way john F. o'donnell naomi caravani uh, philip chang and uh, yeah, so it, so I end up writing about, you know, 16 to 18 minutes, maybe 16 minutes of new material uh, a week for the show, and then we film Thursday nights, and uh, I also, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, but it is it is because uh, there's a lot of research that goes into it too and i and i don't have researchers <laughs> so i do the research myself um for my stuff and and you write the headlines for youtube we've established as well <laughs> yeah and sometimes i schedule the tweets so it's, <laughs> right. uh, it's a lot of a lot of work yeah wow uh well congratulations the, the show seems to be doing pretty well isn't it yeah we we've had a big uh, bump in the past like eight months it's really kind of blown up um and and it's been really cool just like the the people i get to meet now uh you know the, some for example the native americans fighting out in uh, standing rock reservation and getting emails from them and stuff like that and it's it's really rewarding to 
the the fans we get is just very cool. Uh, I think it was I don't think it was his sister, but the the uh, friend of uh, of a sister of the sister of Jeff Wood, the guy, the de new death row inmate. This is unrelated to Kenneth Foster, new death row inmate that was saved recently, uh, or at least for now, he has a stay of execution. Same idea, hadn't killed anyone uh, about to be executed, but she emailed me, and so it's stuff like that that's just hugely rewarding. Awesome. So what are your hopes for uh, your career? I mean, you're a really young guy. Uh, do you want to keep doing the show? You want to do You have bigger plans or what's in your head? I mean, I really, I really love the show and I'd love to see it keep growing in a, a lot of different ways. Um, but I'm, I, I don't see an end goal beyond doing a show like this. Now, could I end up with a much larger staff and we go into a daily show and it changes shape and size and things like that? Then, uh, you know, sure, there's plenty of things that could change. But I think the, the basic idea of creating a show each week on these important issues, you know, we call it Redacted Tonight because we try and cover the issues that are not getting enough news coverage uh, that are kind of redacted from the mainstream media. Uh, that is that is what I want to do, and I'd love to keep doing it. And and you know, there's there's a lot of other things I enjoy doing. I, I you know I'm here in Chicago uh, doing stand-up comedy. I have stand-up comedy dates, and I love doing that as well. But uh, I am in no rush to leave the show or anything. So good luck with it. Continued success. And Thank you, and everybody can watch on YouTube if they'd like. Even I mean, RT America is on television, but if they almost don't, all of it's on YouTube, right? It's all on YouTube as yeah. well. So that's YouTube.com/slash Redacted Tonight. Great. Well, thanks so much for chatting today. Buddy. Thank you, Scott. You've been listening to the How to Write Funny podcast. I'm Scott Dickers, your host. If you want more interviews and comedy writing resources, go to howtowritefunny.com.